Simon Dixon here and welcome to episode 47 of Bitcoin Hard Talk. I am delighted to have a very special guest here with me today, Saifedina Moose, the author of the Bitcoin Standard, the Fiat Standard and the Fundamental Principles in Economics. Um, and uh, Bitcoin Standard was really a book that brought so many people and so many influential people into Bitcoin. In fact, I recently saw on a Tucker Carlson interview with Thomas Messi uh, that he actually read the Bitcoin Standard and that led to the introduction of an end the Fed bill, which is a live bill in Congress or in uh, US politics right now. Um, and uh, that was because he read the book, The Bitcoin Standard, that Saifedina Moose uh, wrote. And it's about 80% economics and 20% Bitcoin. But um, I've been trying to tell people that Bitcoin has always been economics, it's always been geopolitical, and it's always been a resistance movement against central banking uh, from the start and an exit for everybody. And so with that in mind... Um, I want to cover three things with uh, Saifedean today. Uh, the first thing I want to cover is really the role of central banks in driving us into war and what that would look like if we didn't have central banks that can push, that can fund all these atrocities. Um, what some people may not know, uh, which I find absolutely uh, ironic as well, is that uh, Saifedean is a Palestinian economist. Um, and given everything that we're experiencing right now, I've been very vocal about um, the future of the role of Israel in all politics around the world and what's happening in America, what's happening in Palestine and the absolute humanitarian crisis, genocide and atrocities um, that we're experiencing in Palestine right now that's being glossed over. I want, help, I want people to understand a bit more about from somebody you know, that's uh, been brought up in the West Bank um, and uh, understands economics and understands the impacts of all this stuff. And then finally, I want to try it back to Bitcoin, uh, because at the end of the day, there's so much atrocities that the fiat currency world is driving us into right now that we all need some hope. And Bitcoin seems to be the only thing that gives me hope right now. Um, and it allows us to actually have, you know, leave with hope of change and hope of a future. And so... With all those topics in mind, um, we're going to start right at the beginning. Um, so, Saifedean, um, as an economist that uh, really understands Austrian economics and not the brainwashing of what I was taught at university, um, and as somebody that really understands the role of money and central banking, um, is central banking just a war machine? And is that the reason why there are that we're going to be driven into so many wars over time? First of all, thank you so much for having me, Simon. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be talking to you again. I uh, think the short answer to your question is uh, yes. Central banks are a war machine. I think they are the reason that we are where we are and why the world has had so much uh, horrific slaughter happen over the last century. Since the beginning of World War I, I think that really was the turning point because that was when the world economy went off the gold standard effectively. And before that, governments were on the gold standard and they were, uh, or at least on the silver standard. And in both cases, that meant governments couldn't just print money in the case of a crisis, in the case of a war. And so they had a budget and they had to continue to figure out how to finance themselves with the money that they had. And they had to get the money that they would use for fighting which is a lot more complicated when you cannot print it. This is, of course, as Keynesians always remind us, this is the big flaw of gold in their mind, that uh, when the government needs to uh, spend enormous amounts of money destroying uh, capital and doing stupid things, it can't do that with the gold standard because it cannot just print gold. And so if the money is something that the government can print, and it can print at a very low cost, then it becomes very possible for it to print a lot of money whenever there is a crisis and then it becomes very likely that you're going to experience a lot of crises it's just inevitable that this is going to be the case because if crisis means we get to run the money printer we're going to give you a crisis every week and i think this uh, helps a lot explain why 
fiat world is constantly lurching from one crisis to another because each crisis, as long as you got people glued to their TV, glued to their social media, scared, worried, thinking that the world is going to end, you can run the printer as much as you can and you can rob people without people knowing what's really going on. So it makes the process of expropriating people a lot easier than it is under taxation because under taxation, you have to take the money from people's hands, which is complicated and expensive and can be very deadly and violent because people don't like to have money taken from them. So if you start raising taxes on people in order to finance war, people would immediately realize, you know, I care about being able to feed my kids more than I care about killing random foreigners thousands of miles away. So I'm just not going to contribute to this insane uh, genocidal carnage by keeping my money for myself. We'd have a lot less war in that kind of world. But 1914, the world went off the gold standard and we stayed on the fiat standard since then. The world's never been back on the gold standard properly. They tried to do some kind of return to the gold standard after World War One, but it was never a return to the gold standard as existed before 1914, even though the one that existed before 1914 was by no means perfect, it was still a lot better than what came after 1914 because it restricted government creation of money a lot more effectively. Since then, we've just had more and more creation of money, more and more ability for governments to finance all kinds of crazy things. And I think this is just, uh, I like to call it, it's just World War One continuing to play out. I don't think World War One ever ended the world entered permanent war since then because there became a huge bounty on getting into war which is you get to run the money printer yeah so um you mentioned uh, john maynard Keynes, and from my days in economics um i was really taught a couple of things you have classical economics and free markets and then you have keynesian economics um which believes that uh, you need to stimulate uh, government spending in times of uh, bad times, and you need to pay down the debt in good times. Um, nice theory, but it turns out that John Maynard Keynes uh, was invited to Bretton Woods after World War II to architect um, the financial system as we know it today, he managed to convince every country to come off the gold standard on the condition um, that uh, it went on a dollar standard. And the dollar standard then said, well, we'll make sure that we maintain the convertibility of the dollar into gold. And then in 1971, um, I think it was at Bitcoin 2024, RFK said, uh, which is interesting, RFK Jr. Uh, said that uh, Nixon took us off the gold standard because it needed more money for the Vietnamese war, um, which was his uh, causality in terms of those um, sequence of events. Um, but help us understand monetary system um, between World War I, World War II, um, and then, you know, bringing us through a little bit further forward and the role of Keynesian economics. Um, and then after that, we might be able to dive into the side class that I, I would like forcibly be able to have on the side of economics, which was Austrian economics. It was more like this fringe group um, that you had to force through in, in my economics class. Uh, probably asked too many there, but walk us through a bit of that history and the role of Keynesian economics. Yeah, so uh, I think most people know a lot about the role that Keynes had had in this, but one very little known episode of the early impact of Keynes back when very few people had heard of Keynes, when he was pretty young, is something that I discuss in the first couple of chapters of the Fiat Standard, which is a story that is enormously important, but nobody likes to talk about it. It was only uncovered in 2017, something that happened in 1915. And I think this is just absolutely fascinating and very, very informative. So Britain decided to go into World War I, and like everybody who went into gold War, World War I at that point, it was an enormously stupid decision. I think you could look back at the decision-making process. Austria was very stupid to declare war on Serbia. Russia was very stupid to uh, de declare war on Austria. Germany and France and Britain also had their very share, large share of stupidity by declaring these wars because the wars that they were getting into were going to be enormously expensive and they didn't have the ability to afford those wars. So in the case of Britain, they uh, went into the war and then they, um, I mean, the, the decision to go to war was very quick. So they went into war before they could raise the funds for it. So they floated a bond sale in order to finance the war. But 
only about a third of the 400 million pounds that they wanted to sell to finance the war effort only about a third of it was sold to the public the public was just not interested and so about a third was supposed to be picked up by the banking system by the central bank and the banks which is effectively leveraging people's savings in order to finance the war so it's already a high degree of ponzi scammy finance in order to finance the war in the first place but people only bought a third and so then what the bank of england and the treasury did was they colluded to have the bank of england buy the remaining uh, two-thirds or about more than a third of the bonds that was uh, up for sale it bought it under the name of two people who work at the bank of england two high-ranking officers in the bank of england they bought it under their name but they bought it with a line of credit from the Bank of England, and then it was listed on the uh, balance sheet of the Bank of England as other securities when it should have been listed as government securities in order to hide this. And with that, that's how they financed the war. Now, Simon, quick quiz. What do you would you expect would happen if the central bank went and just created a whole bunch of money from nowhere and used it to buy a bunch of bonds and then that was credited on onto the balance sheet of the government and the government went out and spent that money in order to finance its war effort what's likely to happen to the value of the pound in that case it's, it's going to decline and that would also be the case with oh, and that would be reflected in an increase in prices and so during world war one britain started to see rises in prices for the first time in about a century since the napoleonic wars when they did something similar but the difference wasn't the napoleonic wars when it ended they went back to the gold standard so this is how the uh, original sin of fiat happened and I, and, and I just keep talking about the story but very very few people know about it but this is really the original sin of fiat because this is how they financed world war one from day one through effectively inflation and the russians did something similar the russians went off the gold standard the czar went off the gold standard in order to finance the war effort and germany went off the gold standard france everybody went off the gold standard because everybody was printing money to finance the war and this is how they managed to continue to keep fighting for four years even though looking back i think the most startling thing about world war one is when you read it you realize it was truly stupid war because there was nothing really major to be gained or lost for most of these countries so initially the conflict was between serbia and austria nothing could happen between serbia and austria that would justify the price that england paid for that war or the price that russia paid for that war or that the price that france paid for that war there's no way that if you ask the english people before the war here's how much money and how many people need to die for a war that's going to result in the uh, removal of the uh, Kaiser of Germany and the Emperor of Austria and the Tsar of Russia and a bunch of changes in borders that are uh, imperceptible for the vast majority of English people. If you ask them, would this be worth fighting for? Would this be worth all of the money and all the lives that you're going to give? I would say 99% at least would say no. We don't care we wouldn't want to sacrifice for that but with the central bank you can the government can get the people to sacrifice whether they like it or not everybody has to use the banking system everybody has to use the money that the government offers and so the value of the money continues to decline and the value of the work that people earn is continuously expropriated in order to finance the war and finance the carnage so that's how it started that's the original um uh, Keynesian uh, sin, if you want, in 1915. And then after that, an important thing to understand is that when they suspended the redemption of gold in England, they never officially suspended the gold standard, but the government told the banks that they won't pay out gold, they will just pay out paper money instead. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever said that, hey, um, we're going to, we, we figured out that the gold standard is not a good thing and we're going to replace the gold standard with something better. This was never, ever something that anybody proposed seriously. There was never a vote about whether people want to go off the gold standard before they did. When they went off the gold standard, they were told that they weren't going off the gold standard, that this is just war, and that the inflation that you see is just because of war and because of the evil of foreigners. And it was never about the increase of the money supply. And we were going to, back to, to go back to the gold standard. And when the war ended, 
everybody agreed that we need to go back to the gold standard. We have to go back to the gold standard, but they did not go back to the gold standard. You couldn't go back to redeeming your money from the Bank of England like you could before 1914. You could, they, they did something called the, Goulian, the gold bullion standard in 1925 or so. And that allows you to redeem only the large uh, gold bars, but not the small coins. So that means that a lot of people are not going to be able to muster all of the money needed in order to redeem for a big gold bar because a gold, big gold bar is enormously illiquid. It's very expensive to break it down. So you're going to be effectively stuck with your paper slave script. So effectively, they went off the gold standard in 1914, 1915 and never went back. And the reason for all of the economic problems that happened between World War I and World War II is because of this uh, attempt to try and uh, cheat the gold standard by saying we are on the gold standard, but we're actually not, uh, but we still want to be printing money. Because they continued to try and enforce the gold standard at the previous rate, which existed before the war, even though the supply of pounds had increased enormously. And so... It was unsustainable. People were constantly withdrawing gold from England and trying to ship it abroad because England had remained on an inflationary, um, on a much more inflationary um, monetary standard. And so the way that they managed to solve that problem of the gold leaving Britain, and again, here what happens is if you're setting the, if you print a bunch of money and you refuse to set the price of gold where it clears of the market and you insist on having the price of gold at the previous price that you had when you hadn't printed a lot of money, then effectively you are placing a discount on gold legally. You're telling people that your gold can only get you the old amount of paper, even though on the free market it would get you more paper. So what you're telling people is your gold is undervalued here. So what are people going to do with their gold? They're gonna ship it abroad because they can ship it to the US buy physical uh, buy us dollars in the us for their gold and then exchange the us dollars for the british pound and have a larger quantity of pounds so as long as the uk is undervaluing gold it continues to bleed gold unless it can get the us and the other countries to also undervalue their currencies next to gold then if everybody undervalues their currencies similarly then there won't be an arbitrage opportunity so effectively, the way that England got out of its mess was by exporting its mess to the US. So in the 1920s, the British uh, central bankers leaned on the American central bankers to get them to create a bunch of inflation in order to effectively ec import British inflation. And that was what caused the boom of the 1920s. And that was what caused the crash of the 1930s. And that was the cause of the Great Depression. And so, uh, you know, a lot of Americans have a lot of reasons why they hate the British. If you don't hate them for this one, <laughs> your hate doesn't really count. This is the really big one. Uh, forget about all the uh, war of independence nastiness. They gave America the poison chalice of inflationary monetary policy. When the central bank, the American central bank was just new, it did the bidding of the British bankers and the British government by um, creating all of this inflation, which led to the Great Depression, which then, of course, was also global depression because inflation was not just in Britain and the US, it was also a problem everywhere. And so once the British had successfully universalized the inflation problem through the 1920s and 30s, that also created a big incentive for all these governments to continue to become more and more belligerent because they've got a money printer and they've figured out how to use that money printer. And then in the 1930s, because of the crash, they used the excuse of the crash to go off the gold standard formally, which is truly terrible intellectual sleight of hand because they went off the gold standard in 1914 and they continued to suffer economic problems up until 1930, 1934. And at that point, they realized the problem is the gold standard. So then they go off the gold standard. But the problem was going off the gold standard in the first place. And so blaming the gold standard for the problems of going off the gold standard is really propaganda level brain damage. So that was uh, the uh, story between the two world wars. And that's how inflationism came back again in the 1930s after 
uh, not the World War One inflation. And that's how all of these governments around the world became massively armed in the 1930s because they had a big money printer and they started building armies and they started becoming more belligerent and they started getting in each other's noses and they started having delusions of grandeur about, uh, you know, we have a money printer, we can do whatever we want. You see this kind of nationalism picks up and these um, very totalitarian regimes become very powerful. And that, of course, leads to more and more conflict. And I think since World War II, we've also seen an enormous amount of conflict. The U.S. government needs to continuously be uh, engaged in a war, even though, realistically, I don't think there is a single intelligent argument in support of any war that the U.S. has launched since World War II, for sure. You could probably go back a lot earlier than that and say uh, many other many of the U.S. wars have no justification. But I don't think anybody could argue that any of the wars that happened after 1945 have any serious justification for them. Uh, the U.S. was not threatened by any of these adversaries. Uh, nothing happening in Vietnam threatens the U.S. And in, the U.S. intervening makes things worse because the U.S. intervening is an enormous uh, opportunity to get close to the money printer. And so I think most of the world's conflict would be better if the U.S. money printer wasn't there available for people to lobby for and for people to try and manipulate into using it as a way to fight their enemies. If people had to fight their enemies with their own resources, again, it would be a lot more sustainable and they'd be a lot less belligerent. But when they have access to the magical money printer of the U.S., then you see the, I, I think what's going on in Israel right now is a great advertisement of this. If you look at what's going on among Israeli politicians, they are high on the taste of blood in a very serious way in the sense that they realize they're in a position where they can get anything they want from the U.S. and from Britain and from Germany and for the, from the world's richest countries almost and the world's most advanced military technologies. They can have those things at their disposal because they control the political process in these countries. And so they are able to uh, unleash the absolutely most gruesome forms of death with absolutely no accountability. As long as you're connected to the money printer, it doesn't matter. You can kill, torture, mass murder. You can, I mean, as you see, uh, Israeli politicians celebrate the deaths of Palestinian children. Uh, the, 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 there is a video of a minister in the Israeli government dancing at a wedding where they were uh, singing a song about the Palestinian child they managed to burn. I've shared this on my Twitter. And this is uh, this is before October seven. This has always been the case, but this this kind of insane belligerence is, I think, only possible in a world where one party has access to the magic money printer that allows it to just completely suspend the laws of economics and the laws of uh, logic and the laws of war and just engage in the absolutely most gruesome and bloodthirsty kind of behavior. Principles of Economics, my complete guide to understanding economics, is now available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook from SafeAdeen.com, Amazon, and many more booksellers worldwide. And now I am also teaching a course based on this book on my website, SafeAdeen.com. Principles of Economics will run the whole academic year, from September to June, and will have a new lecture every two weeks, as well as weekly live online discussion seminars open to learners from all over the world and from all walks of life. Whether you're a student, a professional, or a retiree, you are making economic decisions every day, and this course will arm you with the wisdom of centuries of economists to improve your economic decision-making. You'll also get a free book of Principles of Economics if you sign up for the course. Go to safeaddeen.com and sign up now. Yeah, um, thank you so much for covering a lot of ground there. Um, and I want people to understand the parallels, and it's the perfect segue into the next topic. But, you know, imagine you've got this interwar period between World War One and World War II, um, and you have to have all these shenanigans and trickery at the central bank in order to be able to find the financial weapons of mass destruction um, in order to, uh, you know, fund uh, these wars and this destruction. There's obviously companies that benefit from that. There is a military industrial complex, whether it be 
the British shit making of the past or whether it be gunpowder or wherever it be uh, today, artificial intelligence, um, you know, and uh, drones and all sorts of technologies that are funding this war. That's an industry in itself. Um, but you have this, um, you know, this, this, these shenanigans that lead us into a war. Um, that then leads to this inflationary cycle. And then if you look at, you know, what happened with Germany, um, you, well, firstly, you have power structures that change the, 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 the checks and controls on these um, atrocities of the money printer. Um, but then, you know, Germany uh, had to negotiate, the Treaty of Versailles comes along, uh, the losing allies and the winning allies, they have to negotiate a deal. Uh, the losing allies, they take on all the debt of the winning allies. They have to settle in gold. Um, they end up having to print loads of money to try and, um, you know, support these excessive debts. Uh, you end up in a bubble in the winning allies countries, and you end up with a hyperinflation recycle um, in, in some of the losing allies in, in Germany as well. Uh, that kind of leads to these extreme politicians on the far left and far right. Uh, you have the rise of Hitler into power in 33. Um, and so think about you know, where we are today. We're having tools that are being used in order to fund these wars. We have money that is being lobbied by political power groups in order to send it to all these different countries that need the weaponry. Uh, the money then comes back into America, which funds the military industrial complex. It supports the stock prices of the war machine. Um, meanwhile, there are people dying because of all these different um, atrocities that are be able to be funded. That money also comes back into the political process. So you can buy Congress, the power structure of the world. We've got these lobby groups that are essentially using money that was printed from the Federal Reserve in order to control the political process. And then suddenly you find yourself in a situation where half of America, um, you know, uh, hate one politician on the extreme left and hate another politician on the extreme right. But yet Netanyahu, the president of Israel, comes to Congress and people are clapping like seals 56 times, like Abraham Lincoln returned from the dead in order to free the slaves um, and he's telling them, Americans, you must go to war with Iran. Iran, by the way, is responsible, according to Netanyahu, for Trump's assassination. Um, and you, you know, and meanwhile, there are people outside protesting um, that this war criminal, which, if uh, uh, on the same week, you know, UK announced, and UK is also a Zionist-controlled state that is subject to the same forces. But they announced that we have to actually listen to the International you know, Criminal Court and the ICJ and the ICC because he's been classified as a war criminal. The acts that have happened because of American-funded money has actually been classified by the South African case as plausible uh, genocide because of all the things that these leaders are saying. Um, and yet he's welcomed with a red carpet more at the same time when who the hell is in charge of America? Biden was having a nap. Um, and, and, and it's almost like Netanyahu came into Congress and the real leader of America was telling both the left and the right um, that's been funded with all this money that's printed by the Fed um, that they need to continue funding the genocide, they need to be more aggressive. Um, and uh, we're, we're seeing in real time, you know, the, the, this, this rolling out in front of us. Um, America's completely losing its credibility. Britain's losing its credibility. Um, on social media, everything's um, being um, covered. But what people don't know is that actually, or they probably know by now, or that's a crazy thing, um, but Biden perpetuated a bunch of lies around what actually happened on October the 7th. Sure, there were atrocities, um, but there were complete lies and complete fabrications. Um, there were not 40 beheaded babies. Um, the United Nations research has said that there is no um, evidence of systemic rape or any of these things that would justify it. Um, and then people have to go back and look at history and we find out that there was another abomination that happened in 1917. 
And that was that there was an Ottoman Empire in the Middle East and uh, Britain uh, was um, deciding what its oil strategy was in the Middle East. And in 1917, decided that it would declare uh, Palestine uh, to Lord Rothschild. Um, uh, sorry, the, I got that wrong. It would declare uh, Palestine to Lord Rothschild um, and support this entity called the Zionist entity. Um, and uh, obviously there were atrocities that came from World War II, like the Holocaust, but it turns out that that's been used in order to weaponize the Jewish faith um, and create this, this Zionist entity, create this state of Israel, um, which suddenly today uh, leads to all these different things where we're told that we're meant to be in a battle between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Literally, UK is in crisis over it right now because of these foreign entities that are manipulating politics. Um, but, uh, you know, when you really look back at it, you find out that, uh, you know, Britain declared um, Palestine to the Zionist entity. Um, there were these terrorist groups called Haganah that are now because they got statehood, managed to turn it into, um, you know, uh, Israel. Um, and we see this decades and decades of occupation, ethnic cleansing, genocide, uh, fabricated with lie after lie through political power in order to make people think that um, the Jewish people, where their religion was hijacked by the Zionist entity, um, is in a faith, is in a war against terror, which was a series of false flag operations in order to take the faith of 2.2 billion people and connect it to extreme groups, which funded by many of the intelligence agencies and money that sits outside um, of congressional approval. Um, we see mass, mass, mass manipulation on a scale we've never seen before. Um, and we can clearly see that uh, this is just leading to more NATO expansion, probably NATO expansion in the Middle East led by Israel and NATO expansion in Japan um, and uh, Philippines uh, that probably is going to come after uh, China. Um, and we can just see that this is all a war machine, central banks and psychological operations and intelligence agencies that are fooling us in making us think. So the... Tell us what you would like to, from your perspective as somebody, I believe you were born in the West Bank, what do Americans need to understand? Um, I think one tweet, and I'll end it there, that you put out there is that um, America is a puppet state of Israel. Like from your perspective, what is it that Americans are not seeing here? Um, and why are people justifying what is clearly and even ruled at the highest level, a plausible genocide uh, at, um, enacted by war criminals and, and, and more atrocity after atrocity. I'll stop there. Yeah, so I think I'll just begin with uh, strictly addressing the, the exact question you asked, which is what Americans need to know. My, the only thing that I want from Americans is to have absolutely nothing to do with the entire thing. I think I'm. I don't want. I don't demand that Americans know things about the conflict. I don't care if they do. I'd like them to just stop intervening at all. So if America was not intervening in this at all, then I think it, the situation would be a lot better for everybody involved. I think it would be a lot more peaceful if we didn't have this enormous money printer that is just uh, completely weaponized by one side in order to mass murder the other. And Americans you don't have to know anything about the details of this conflict in order to, if you have any kind of integrity, just say that, no, we as a government, as a country, as a state, as a nation should not be funding other governments. I think this is one of the founding principles of the United States. George Washington spoke about it, that the U.S. should not have entangling alliances. The founders of the U.S. came from Europe, and one of the things that they wanted to escape from Europe was the wars of all these kings and tribes that kept fighting over pieces of land for centuries. And in the U.S., it was a country built on the principles of personal freedom, personal property, and it wanted to break away from this world of old uh, conflicts and bitter fights. So you don't have to know anything about the conflict in order to think that for, it's in no 
uh, way useful for the US to be intervening. And I think the more you learn about the conflict, the more you realize this is 100% true. The US stands to gain absolutely nothing from its support to Israel. And I think I've, I've been talking about this for years now, and I keep challenging people to give me one example of what the US gains from this. And there's never a coherent answer. As you, the best answer you'll get is something along the lines of, well, the uh, Israelis are keeping our enemies in check or they're fighting our enemies in the Middle East. And this is completely idiotic because the only reason those people are the Americans' enemy is because America fights Israel's enemies for it because America is an Israeli puppet state. I really believe this is the case. I think there's very strong evidence to suggest it. And I think this is something that uh, is indisputable, indisputable at this point. You cannot argue that there is anything good that comes to the people of the United States from their government being um, out there serving Israel to continue its own uh, genocidal project of land theft. Ultimately, what Israel is, you spoke about the Balfour Declaration, that really is for me the beginning of the conflict, and it is because people who appreciate capitalism who appreciate private property should be able to grasp this very easily i think uh, it's it's unfortunate that the conflict gets portrayed usually in leftist terms of what well, this is colonialism and white supremacism and all that i think all of that stuff is irrelevant this is theft the conflict is about theft it's a very simple thing in 1917 Lord Balfour of the British government issued the declaration. He was a foreign minister at that point, and he said the British government views with favor the establishment of a national homeland for Jews in Palestine. At that point, the population of Palestine was approximately 3% Jewish. 97% was non-Jewish, mostly Muslims and Christians, or almost entirely Muslims and Christians. So if you try and think of any spot of the world today, any geographic unit of the world today, where you have a 3% minority and somebody says, let's make this into a national homeland for the 3%, how do you think that's going to play out over the coming years or decades? It's not going to work out nicely. It's going to be very brutal. People don't like to be made foreigners in their land. They're not going to like that. They don't like to be kicked out of their homes. They don't like to be um, expelled and murdered. And so they're going to fight back. And this is ultimately what has happened. The British government needed to give the Balfour Declaration in World War I, and this is how it all ties into fiat, which I think is uh, it's, it's tragic, but it's almost poetic in, its, uh, in how it all, in, in, in how Israel is so thoroughly a fiat creation. The entirety of Israel is just a fiat from day one. Because, I mean, the, the meaning of the word fiat is that it is just trying to impose reality on the ground by decree rather than by what natural order dictates. And that's exactly what was going on. You have a land where 97% of the population is not Jewish, and then by fiat, it needs to be made into a Jewish homeland. That was That became the prime directive of the British Empire. And it's also fiat in a very real sense, because why were the British in the middle of a world war making promises about... Uh, Palestine. Why? They're, they're, they've got bigger fish to fry. They're in a war with uh, Germany and Austria and the Ottoman Empire. Why in particular would they care so much about uh, Palestine? And why give the declaration specifically to Lord Rothschild? Effectively, probably the richest family in the world at that time. And the answer is, and, and you can read this on the Rothschild family's uh, website. Uh, I think it's called the Rothschild Archive. On the website, they discussed the Balfour Declaration, and they say that part of the reason or one of the motivations for it was that the British wanted to get the Americans into the war. This is the other thing for British people, for American people who want to hate the British. You've got so many good reasons. Uh, everybody in the world does. Uh, but, you know, I still love British people. Uh, I'll, I'll always credit the British people because they didn't buy the bonds of the World War I. Uh, this, for me, will always make British people great. But it's the British government that is just cancer. Uh, but the, the, in order to try and get the Americans into war, they promised Palestine to the Zionists because they thought that the Zionist movement had enough support among evangelical Christians and uh, Americans that it would help attract uh, uh, help bring the U.S. into the war. And that is indeed what happened. It was, uh, we'll give you Palestine if you can bring the U.S. into the war. And the U.S. had absolutely no good reason to interfere in World War One. 
like any one of the belligerents in World War I, they have no reason to get into that war. And uh, it quickly became clear to them that intervening in the war was not really helping things. They were used by their allies, exploited in order to su uh, um, subjugate the enemies in a way that was completely counterproductive that led to the dynamic which led to World War II, which created all kinds of different uh, catastrophes. So there was no point in the US interfering in World War I. I think this is really the key thing. But it was their intervention that um, made Britain want to give Palestine to the Rothschild family. The idea was that the Rothschild family and similar uh, Zionist families were quite influential in the US. They would manage to sway US public opinion in favor of war. And that was indeed what happened. So uh, the, because the British were broke, because of fiat money, uh, that's why they gave the Balfour Declaration. And then since then, from 1917, the British took over Palestine. And since then, they were working hard in order to try and turn Palestine into Jewish national homeland. So the other lands that they got, so the British also had uh, uh, Jordan, uh, Egypt, the French had Lebanon, Syria. In all of those countries, the colonial powers who took over worked on developing a state to take over after they leave or to, to build the form for self-governance for the people that were there, except in Palestine where the self-governance was going to be provided for people who weren't there, who were a very tiny minority. And so from the beginning, the British are formulating and, and helping the uh, Zionists build state institutions and fighting the Palestinians and preventing them from doing that. They allowed the British, they allowed the Zionist militias to arm these terrorist organizations that started targeting Palestinians and British people in the 1930s. And they fought the Palestinians and prevented the Palestinians from arming themselves and disarmed the Palestinians. The Palestinians launched the first Intifada, which was in 1936 to 1939. That was the biggest anti colonial struggle of the interwar period. It was three years of bloody uprising against the British army and the Jewish terrorist organizations. And at the end of it, the Palestinians were effectively disarmed. And that was really the true catastrophe for Palestine was 1936 to 1939. 48 was the consequence of that. So by 1948, the Palestinians were disarmed and the Zionists were being armed more and more and they were importing more and more weapons. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. This podcast is also brought to you by the Bitcoin way, your professional Bitcoin IT team offering you personalized, secure and comprehensive solutions for every step along your Bitcoin journey. The Bitcoin way offer live concierge service to guide you with your Bitcoin cold storage, running your node, privacy best practices, inheritance planning, corporate strategy and multi-sig solutions. They don't touch your coins, they guide you through the process of acquiring your coins and securing them. If you'd like to make your setup safer and more reliable, book a consult with them and see what they have to suggest. If you want to give someone the gift of Bitcoin, get them this professional service that will ensure they start off knowing exactly how to manage their coins and not lose them. Go to thebitcoinway.com and start Bitcoining more confidently. Uh, from abroad, of course, here, you've, if, you've, if, if you've been subjected to Israeli propaganda, you get the David versus Goliath idea that, uh, well, the Israelis were just this plucky little upstart nation of hardworking people surrounded by a sea of hostile monster barbarians and miraculously the Israelis managed to somehow win. That's completely ridiculous. This was uh, a heavily financed movement of socialists primarily and uh, funded by some extremely rich banks and extremely rich families from all over Europe and the US. They had an enormous amounts of resources. Their main shortage was people because the majority of Jews didn't want to move to Palestine. The vast majority of Jews who were all over the world, they considered Judaism as a part of their identity, but they identified mainly with their countries. So uh, even, even into the 1930s, the vast majority of Europeans, even after the rise of Hitler, 
they were not coming to Palestine. They were trying to go to the US or Canada or Australia, places that were more culturally similar to what they had uh, lived in. So this was a heavily top-down uh, process of funding coming from the, uh, the, the, the rich Europeans with weapons coming from the Soviet Union and from socialist movements across Europe with enormous amounts of support from the British government. Uh, Lord Balfour, I think, really said it really well when he said in one of his uh, um, remarks, this was, I think, in the 1920s, much after, much later, m uh, after the Balfour Declaration was released, he said something along the lines of, it doesn't matter what the Palestinian people think, we as Britain are committed to Zionism, be it right or wrong, and that is something that is far more important than the, I have, forget the exact phrasing than the uh, thoughts or rights or uh, beliefs or ideas of the local population. It doesn't matter. So you're destroying the basis of society, which is private property, based on the vision of a bunch of people sitting in London deciding that this should be for that. So if you do this anywhere in the world, you're going to result in conflict. And then effectively what happened in 1947 and 1948 was the mass theft of Palestinian land by the Zionist terrorist groups that had been building up weapons. And uh, 1947, they uh, targeted the British with a lot of uh, terrorism to leave. I mean, the British had built up the foundations of the Zionist state, but then the Zionists wanted them to leave so that they could uh, have the country and so that they could expel the Palestinians, which was difficult for them to do when the British were there. And so they kept working on expelling the Palestinians and began the true systematic expulsion in 1947. Go to villages and bombard the villages uh, or massacre an entire village and then tell the other villages that were coming. And it was a systematic genocidal policy of clearing land. They had clear maps of what they were doing. They were they They, they targeted the right properties they needed to target in order to or the right villages and towns in order to achieve territorial contiguity between their uh, colonies. I think the most important fact to know perhaps about the Palestinian conflict is that in 1945, the British did a very thorough survey of the land of Palestine. And they found that the Jewish National Fund, which owned uh, most of the land that was being uh, used, that would later on become land for the state, and all the Jewish settlers, they owned something along the lines of 5.6% of the land of Palestine. Something like 45% of the land was uh, not privately owned. It was like public land, which is mainly the desert in the south, even though that, by some definitions, you could say that it is owned by the tribes that uh, control different regions. But even if you take that as being publicly owned, then within the private land, there was only about 10.5% of the land that was owned by Jewish settlers, and something like 89.5% was owned by people who weren't Jewish. So this is, not, this is still 1945, after almost 30 years of the Balfour Declaration, after millions of dollars in financing to build militias and terrorist organizations and massacre Palestinians and kick them out to uh, all uh, after all of the incentives that are being provided for Jews all over the world to try and migrate to Palestine when many of them didn't want to, you still were at a point where only 5% of the land was Jewish owned and the vast majority was not Jewish owned. So then how do you change that? You murder people, you kick them out, you steal their land. And that's what Israel did in 1947 to 48. Of course, here they'll tell you, well, the Arabs attacked it's not true. They started with the ethnic cleansing long before the Arabs attacked. The Arabs only attacked in 1945, sorry, in May 1948. But the ethnic cleansing had started uh, uh, in 1947. So they'd already expelled more than 250,000 Palestinians before any Arab soldier had attacked. So there was a clear genocide that was going on where they were expelling as many Palestinians as they could. And the Palestinians were practically unarmed. They had no militaries, whereas the Zionists had highly well-trained militaries that had uh, some of the soldiers of, who had experience in World War II and had come from some of the uh, top militaries in World War II. And so 
That was the war of 1948. Israel, of course, had an enormous advantage in terms of its weaponry uh, at the uh, in the 1947-48 war over the Palestinian people, but also over the Arab armies who were fighting in foreign terrain, who were novice armies for which this was the first war, and they were fighting uh, in, in uh, far away distances from them, and who very clearly had no illusions about uh, destroying Israel because it was not possible at that point. They tried to try and... Um, prevent Israel from taking as much land as it could, but there was no illusion about being able to destroy Israel. In fact, there were some negotiations between the countries, and it was clear that they were over borders and not a fight over existence. But that was 1948. Then, uh, since then, effectively the same thing has been going on in slow motion and now in very uh, fast motion since 1940, since last year, since October. And that thing is. Uh, what the Zionist movement calls is probably its motto. They call it more land, fewer Arabs. That's what they've been trying to achieve. So they're constantly taking more land from Palestinians and constantly trying to kill and expel as many Palestinians as possible. And this has really gone to extreme heights over the past few years with the amount of support that Israel gets. It's got it to a point where it hasn't doesn't have to abide by any of the conventions of civilized society, any of the conventions of civilized countries. It's going, it's it's taking war back 2,000 years, 3,000 years in its barbarity. And the world had already, by the beginning of the 20th century, had moved on to concepts of uh, wars between, trying to keep wars between, and this has been going on for centuries, as actually, uh, Europeans had developed laws of war wherein you don't target uh, civilians, you keep war to, fighting combatants, and it, was, it isn't just Europeans. I mean, in Islam, this stuff has been uh, mentioned in the Quran for 1400 years that you shouldn't be attacking civilians and so on. But historically, you see that as humans advance, as we become more and more civilized, we become more civilized in our conduct of war. But now Israel is just completely destroying this because they're going completely nuts. So um, this is my kind of overall back ground on the conflict now on the question of why is the us a puppet state i think yes the us is indeed a, an israeli puppet state i said the first reason which is that it has uh, no interest in the middle east whatsoever this notion that they're doing all of this stuff for the oil is idiotic anybody who believes this is not a serious grown adult because if you look at people in ecuador in switzerland in kenya in thailand they all managed to put oil in their car engines without having to launch wars in the Middle East. Um, they just buy the oil on the market. And guess who else has to buy oil from their gas station, which buys it from the distributor, which buys it on the global markets, like everybody else? The Americans who are suckered into sending all of their wealth to fight these wars, thinking that somehow they're going to be getting oil out of this. It's so idiotic. And if you're one of the people who thinks the U.S. is getting oil out of any of those wars, I congratulate you on your uh, level of stupidity, which really is good punishment for having the level of depravity of thinking that it would be a good thing to go around killing people in order to take the literal scum of the earth, a very cheap material that uh, goes into our machines that's very cheap to produce and ship all over the world. You don't need to fight wars over oil. There's an enormous liquid market of oil all over the world. And anybody anywhere can buy oil. It's very difficult to, it's almost impossible unless you can impose a physical embargo on a physical location. It's not possible to freeze somebody out from the market of gold uh, for, for oil because there's just Production of oil happens all over the world, and you'll always find somebody who's willing to sell you some oil. So the U.S. has no interest in being in any of that uh, for the sake of oil. And I think you know the the, the beautiful irony of Americans who thought, "Yeah, we're going to go to Iraq and we're going to get the oil," and then they found that their oil prices shot up after the war in Iraq. It, the barrel of oil got to one hundred and forty dollars in two thousand and eight. Where's all the free oil that they promised you? I mean, it, if that doesn't get you to ask questions, then you are beyond saving. The reality of the matter is that you don't get free oil. Countries are not pinatas where you smash them and then you just get to take their stuff. In order to produce oil, there needs to be security. There needs to be an enormous division of labor and an enormous amount of capital in order to create economic production. 
and for that you need peace and when you go and you fight wars you are destroying their ability to produce oil but more importantly you're destroying your currency to finance the stupid war for which there is no reason and that is only going to be done with inflation and so the way that that's going to translate to you practically is that prices are going to go up for you so that's the only thing that you get from this idiotic idea that we need to go on these adventures in those countries to get our oil you don't israel uh, america has absolutely no interest in any of the wars of the middle east if tomorrow al-qaeda was to take over the entire middle east and control all of the oil production from morocco to afghanistan it wouldn't matter the us would still get its oil maybe it'll get it from the middle east maybe it'll get it from elsewhere because you know what is the what is al-qaeda going to do with all of that oil what are they going to do smoke it they're going to have to pump it out and sell it in order to pay their bills that's what everybody who controls it's going to do so whether it's al-qaeda or israel or anyone who's going to control all of that region the best and worst thing they can do with their oil is pump it out and sell it on the free market mm -hmm. which is what everybody else is going to be doing so there's no reason for israel to be interfering uh, for the us to be interfering in those wars and if you look at why they got into the war in iraq and you look at what their policy has been after 9 11 it becomes very clear that, that what the war was about was israel taking out israel's enemies and uh, the israelis had worked on this through something called the project of the new american century a bunch of israelis pretending to be americans uh, in a think tank in washington dc came up with this idea that we need to have the u.s secure the new american century of course this is all of this stuff about hegemony and global empire and securing the u.s's place in the world is um <laughs> lies to lie to, to to deceive morons who believe in this kind of garbage it means nothing the, the the idea that the u.s needs to go around smashing random countries in order to prove leadership or bring democracy is complete garbage and if you believe that you're an idiot it's clearly the reason they wanted to take out those countries was because those countries were hostile to israel and now we can see how this is the case if iraq syria libya were still around they would probably be a lot more complicated uh, to deal with than um, what israel is having to deal with right now as it carries out a genocide where it's trying to destroy the lives of two and a half million people and just make them homeless and um so you can see why this is clearly in the benefits of Israel. You can see why the Israelis were planning for something like this from the 1990s. And then you can see how they had so many people in uh, power who were sympathetic to this agenda. And so they got the US into all of these wars for the sake of Israel. And I think this is something that's becoming clearer and clearer to a lot of Americans that realize now America gained nothing from these wars. America lost a lot of lives and a lot of wounded soldiers, a lot of wounded veterans, and a lot of money, and it got absolutely nothing from it. Israel benefited from that. Israel benefits from the U.S.'s profligacy with its aid to Israel. As the U.S. gives Israel billions of dollars every year. They gave them maybe, I think, 20, 30 billion dollars just over the last year during this war. This is completely insane, completely ridiculous, and there's absolutely no way that anybody can justify it. It's insane. The US, the Israel is not a poor country. It does not need aid. And the US gets absolutely nothing from financing this genocidal regime as it goes around murdering people. And uh, we can see it through the influence of AIPAC. AIPAC effectively controls US politics. They brag about it. They It's very difficult for any politician to oppose them. They take out all their opponents. And AIPAC is a one issue political action committee and that issue is israel it's a foreign agent it's an agent of a foreign government but it does not get to register as a foreign agent because again if it registered as a foreign agent it would be extremely limited in what it could do and that would limit its effectiveness and since the uh, since it is very effective it's managed to keep itself away from registering but i think you know the uh, also you could look at the way that congress behaves i mean the, the, there is more opposition to israeli government policy in israel in the israeli parliament and in the israeli cabinet than there is in the congress as as you mentioned all these uh, prostitutes trotted out to clap like seals uh, just complete uh com complete ser servile relationship where there's absolutely no sense of anybody trying to talk 
or oppose any of what is going on. Uh, there, there is no sense of debate within the American Congress about whether we should be supporting this or we should supporting that. And that's just clearly unhealthy, unnatural. It's not something that happens in random countries. This is not what an alliance looks like. An alliance is two countries that respect each other, that have a formal treaty on clear terms that say, if you go into a war with this country, we will enter the war. If you go into a war with that country, we will not enter the war, maybe. All kinds of terms for how those two countries manage the relationships. The US does not have a treaty with Israel. The US is not an ally of Israel. Israel has never fired a single bullet in any American war. The US has supported Israel in every war. It has troops on the ground in Gaza this year, and it has given Israel all the weapons that it needs. And it, if effectively America's wars are Israel's war. America has no reason to be fighting most of its wars that has been fighting recently, but it does so for the sake of Israel. But I think the most obvious and completely, um, completely irrefutable proof that America is an Israeli puppet state is the USS Liberty. I think the attack on the USS Liberty truly is something that is amazing. And I think I'd say 90% of Americans have never heard of it. Uh, at this point, I think if you conducted a poll, you I, I would be uh, shocked if more than 10% of Americans had even heard of it. But this was in 1967 where Israel attacked for more than an hour a clearly marked uh, U.S. boat called the USS Liberty with a couple of hundred sailors on it. And they destroyed it and they tried to get it sunk. They tried to sink. They shelled it with artillery. They shelled it with aerial bombardment. And they kept on trying to sink it, but then they failed at sinking it because the uh, they uh, and they hit the communications so that they couldn't send a distress signal out. One of the people on board managed to get a signal out, and then another American boat headed to the location. At which point, the Israelis had to stop their attack, and they couldn't sink the boat. Uh, but they killed uh, thirty-six, I think, uh, sailors on it, and they wounded more than a hundred, I think, uh, close to two hundred sailors. So. Uh, this was a just broad daylight, clear, sunny day on the Mediterranean. And there's absolutely no chance that they didn't know it. In fact, we have the recording of the Israeli pilots who were given the instructions to target this. And when they arrived at the scene, they saw the American flag. They knew that it was an American boat. They told command center, this is an American boat. And command center told them, yes, never mind, go ahead, hit it. And they did hit it. They knew that it was an American boat. But why did they hit it? Well, I thought initially, I used to think that it was just a, 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 a display of um, real power that don't come near our country. And if you come near our country, we take out your soldiers and we can take out your soldiers and your military is run by a civilian leadership and your civilian leadership are a bunch of prostitutes that we constantly that we control and therefore they're not going to do anything to us so this was a i thought it was just a message to the american military i recently looked into it more deeply and i think it's actually more likely that, that was not the point i think this was a, a unintended effect of it of what actually happened is that this taught the u.s military the idea that their civilian leadership is actually uh, working for mm -hmm. israel not for the u.s military to the point that israel could literally kill american soldiers and the american politicians will side with israel against the american soldier but i don't think that that was the point uh, this was happening during the 1967 war and i think the what was going on was that they were sinking it the point was to implicate egypt in the sinking of the boat and then once the boat is gone then there will be no survivors to report that it was israel that uh, shot the boat down and then the us would think that it was egypt that did it and then the us would attack egypt and that's what israel wanted to do now the boat didn't sink so we have survivors and they reported it but the thing has been just completely covered up and forgotten in america it's absolutely astonishing so Ask yourself, if you heard about a country that has its soldiers attacked by another country and then nothing happens, nothing. There's no angry phone call from your president to the other president. There's no, uh, there's no strain in diplomatic ties. In fact, your Congress spends the next day celebrating the victory of Israel in the, the Six-Day War. What kind of relationship is that? It's very, very, very clearly a relationship of suzerainty. It's just a puppet state. That's what the U.S. is. 
This podcast is brought to you by my friends at Coinbits, the oldest Bitcoin only exchange. If you're listening to this podcast, you get that Bitcoin upends everything that government schools teach about money. Coinbits is the money app designed for people like you who understand Bitcoin and want to use it every day. Coinbits pioneered the concept of roundups, which converts your spare change into Bitcoin. Simply connect your debit and credit cards and your usual purchases are rounded up to the nearest dollar, letting you save more in Bitcoin as you spend more. My favorite new Coinbits feature is Spending Insights, which gives you real-time feedback about how much of your money is chasing high-time preference, short-term gratification, and how much you are providing for your future with low-time preference choices. As always, Coinbits provides a terrific self-custody experience. Connect a hardware wallet for automatic withdrawals, so you keep counterparty risk to a minimum. Coinbits also offers peer-to-peer cash and Bitcoin payments, target orders, price alerts, and more. Coinbits can help you do almost anything you need with Bitcoin. Go to coinbits.app slash and get three months free. Again, that is coinbits.app slash saifeddin, S-A-I-F-E-D-E-A-N. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by Orange Pill App, the Bitcoin-only social network that connects you with high-signal Bitcoiners, events, and now merchants as well. If you're like me and can't stop talking about Bitcoin, you know how challenging it can be to talk to the no-coiners and how nice it is to talk to someone who gets you. With the Orange Pill app, you can find the Bitcoiners near you and they can replace the no-coiners in your life. You can organize events and meetups with local Bitcoiners and wherever you travel, you can meet up with local Bitcoiners all while being as anonymous as you like. So if you want to build your local network of Bitcoiners, find a Bitcoin meetup or merchants accepting Bitcoin, head over to orangepillapp.com to sign up or download the app from the App Store or Google Play Store and send me a DM so we can get connected. Yeah, um, thank you so much for doing that. And um, I did deep, I deep, you know, did a deep dive into so many of these different operations and the way that they were presented versus the impact they had. And then you look at the evidence and the whitewashing of evidence. And you do see a repeatable pattern, uh, which is that Israel is willing to engage in atrocious acts um, and that lead to the death of their allies and then completely whitewash and, and change the story in order to incentivize another, act, uh, another type of action. Um, and we've seen this time and time again, and we could go into so many of them, um, but anyone that goes down this rabbit hole you'll suddenly enter into a world where you look back at the decades and decades of wars and experiences that have happened, the destabilizations of regions, you know, the um, coup d'etats, um, the overthrow of government in the name of exporting democracy, um, and all of the regime changes that we've seen time and time again, you start to see this repeatable pattern. And that's why I want Bitcoiners to get this. Uh, because at the end of the day, this whole conflict, and there's so much more you can go into, um, uh, that it is a Bitcoin story. It's one of property rights, you know, and it's one of inflation. Um, and it's uh, it's uh, just the, the basic story of how war is actually funded. Um, and suddenly we get to understand that, um, you know, we're told that um, Americans are meant to support this, but who's going to pay for it in the end? Well, it's going to be more wealth inequality. It's going to be more inflation. It's going to be more money printing. Um, and we're at a stage right now where the wealth inequality in America is driving record levels of homelessness. Um, it's driving the types of human behaviors where people can't even afford to have children anymore. So there's demographic crisis. Um, and then you bring that back to some of the wars. And so I want to cover one more topic, but I also want everyone to just appreciate where we are right now on the stage, you know, so America's being told that it needs to go to war with Iran. Um, we're in a situation right now where Iran is going to be retaliating in Israel. That's something that um, following the rules of engagement, Article 51 has been um, enabled and there's going to be a retaliation. Um, but because of the sanctions of Iran and Russia, um, you're ending up with this new alternative block being created where, you know, oil needs to be sold um, in order to subsidize the economic damage of these sanctions. And so you've driven this, these, you know, this global north and global south um, region. You've got uh, the dollar that's now trying to be competed with all of these really shitty currencies being put together through BRICS. But now 
They're all doing trade together. And Iran, Russia, and China have no choice uh, but to, you know, do trade with each other and combat the, the, these uh, financial sanctions. Uh, and so we're literally on the verge of what looks very similar to these, uh, the environment pre-World War I and pre-World War II, uh, where the, you know, we're going to have about $10 trillion dollars um, on, of government debt on the Federal Reserve balance sheet. You've got governments that have got bigger and bigger and bigger. Wealth inequality is driving extreme left, extreme right um, behavior. Um, you've got inflation that's causing all of this wealth inequality. Um, and now you're being given all these justifications with civil unrest um, that you should be going to war and that you're at a war for your freedom. Um, and the only thing that we have in order to exit that is that you can own your own property, which is Bitcoin. You can spend your own property, which is Bitcoin, and you can combat the atrocities of this proof of weapons network that seems to have banks as miners um, and lobby groups as node operators and that's driving the world deeper and deeper into every country in the world doubling their NATO budget and doubling their military budget. Um, and so we're at a very, very uh, you know, dangerous time America's already energy independent. You've got your own oil um, at the moment. Some of those reserves are being depleted. Um, and uh, you've got all your foreign bases in the Middle East. And, and now this is all being disrupted because there's this one country, Israel, that's got this illegal nuclear weapon that is undeclared as per the rules. Um, and it wants to be the sole nuclear power in the Middle East uh, to create all these corridors. And went on United Nations and said... Um, here's the map of the Greater Israel Project that involves Jordan, parts of Jordan, uh, parts of Syria, parts of Iraq, parts of Egypt. Um, there is no West Bank. There is no Palestine. And this was before October the 7th. So um, I know you could go down. We could talk a whole lot more about that. But I want to end on one subject as well, um, which is just really the hope. So it seems like Israel is a creation of the fiat currency proof of weapon network and central banking. Um, is there possible that countries can take the story of what El Salvador has done? You know, um, they can buy one Bitcoin a day, they can put it on the government's balance sheet. And can government start to rebuild a financial system on Bitcoin? We're already starting to see that apparently in America, in, in an environment of 35 trillion dollars of debt. They might want to build a Bitcoin strategic reserve. It doesn't pay down the national debt. This is, it's a stupid thing when you understand how fiat currency works. Um, but can Palestine, um, can countries uh, start using Bitcoin? And can we really create this exit velocity from fiat currency, where in, every individual does a peaceful protest against fiat currency and war by owning Bitcoin? Every company starts putting uh, Bitcoin on their balance sheet um, and starts having the benefit of a wealth effect, of sound money, um, of being able to reinvest rather than leveraging debt. And can countries do the same? Like, what is the hope that we have for the future? Um, and what is the role of Bitcoin in that? And we'll have to end there, but we'll bring you back if you'll, have us, if you'll come again. With pleasure. I'd say I think the, the key thing for Bitcoin is that it uh, robs the uh, money printer of the ability to rob you. And this functions on an individual level. And that's the best thing about it is that you don't need to get the world to adopt Bitcoin in order for you to be able to use Bitcoin. So uh, Bitcoin has now achieved a level of liquidity where you can pretty much get Bitcoin for cash anywhere in the world and you're able to sell and buy large quantities of Bitcoin pretty much anywhere in the world. And I think this is enormously significant because it means that you can keep your wealth, your savings in Bitcoin, and that would then protect you personally from being robbed in order to finance this. So if you are the kind of person who has a conscience, if you don't like to be in, uh, implicated in the uh, murder of innocent people, if you don't like to spend your wealth, the money that you work for on murdering children, then Bitcoin is for you. Bitcoin provides you a way to clear your conscience out of that, uh, off that because you are able to just have your wealth remain with you 
uh, because you save it in a form of money that can't be debased. And so the debasers need to go leech on some other people other than you. So this is the first thing on an individual level. And then I think as more and more people adopt it, you compromise and take away the ability of the money printer to continue to operate. And I think this is really the hope here. Now, it's true, we did have hard money before in the form of gold, but the problem with gold, as I discussed in the fiat standard, is that it's very expensive to clear and verify gold across international borders, and that requires centralization over central banks, and that becomes very easy for governments to capture and to kill the market around it. We don't have that problem with Bitcoin. You can clear Bitcoin around the world for very small fees. You can verify it very cheaply, and so therefore, you don't need to rely on government monopoly banks in order for your Bitcoin to work. And therefore, you don't want, uh, you, you don't need the government to bless your choice and you don't need to lobby them for it. You can just Bitcoin on your own and people don't even need to know. You can secure your own Bitcoins without anybody even finding out about you having bought Bitcoin. So the more people do that, the more wealth is stored in Bitcoin, and the less of that wealth can be used through debasement. Eventually, even the biggest currencies crash and come crumbling down over time and that really is the promise i think as individuals become better able to secure their own wealth they will become a lot more rational in how they behave they will become a lot more civilized in how they behave because they will they, they will want to look out for their own interest and bitcoin aligns people's incentives with one another because it's you start seeing that there's just no way of cheating the system by trying to make Bitcoin. So instead of dedicating your time and effort in order to cheating the system and trying to create more Bitcoin or more money in order to rob others of their purchasing power, you start dedicating your time and effort on to productive activities because that's the best long-term strategy for stacking Bitcoin. So that for me is the long-term hope for humanity that uh, as we switch onto a Bitcoin standard, we become rational calculating people who figure out that being productive and peaceful is the best thing to do to increase your balance of sats over time. And I think if we uh, put the money printer out of business and we have people become so much more cooperative and long-term oriented, I think we will have a lot better planet. We'll have a world that's much better, would reverse all the damage that's been done to the planet over the last hundred years of fiat nonsense. I couldn't agree more. Um, and there are so many different topics that I'd love to go down, but we're already over. So we're going to have to um, end it there. Um, and, you know, I want to leave everyone with that call to action, put the money printer out of business. Um, quite frankly, I don't think it's an exaggeration. Now we can now see the direct ties between right in front of us, murdering children um, and things that society has already decided shouldn't be part of anything today. Apartheid, justification of sexual violence and rape, all sorts of stuff that we're seeing right now, right in front of us. And we can see it's coming from the money printer of the Federal Reserve that's causing inflation, that's driving people deeper into debt. Um, and we're having cost of living crisis and all the negative externalities that come from, quite frankly, people being broke and much of the fiat wealth being concentrated in those that are able to control the lobby group in order to engineer the system so that more of this larger and larger and larger government um, is used to benefit a few. Um, and Bitcoin is the reverse of that. It's the antithesis of that. It gives you property rights. It gives you self-sovereignty. Um, it gives you the ability to spend your money peer to peer. And it gives you most importantly, the way to actually um, you know, function in today's society and make better decisions. Um, and I want you all to read, if you haven't read it already, I'm sure much of my audience have, but you should read and start with the Bitcoin standard. If you enjoy the Bitcoin standard, you should then read the fiat standard. Um, and then everyone needs to understand economics and principles of economics. So go through that rabbit hole. Uh, Saifedean on you can go to his website, I think it's saifedean.com. He's got lots of courses and things and everything um, you can do to engage in this topic. Because quite frankly, understanding this subject is now the difference between World War Three, life, death, and you protecting your property um, because the governments and the fiat currency is not taking the world in the direction that I like. So exit, join here, 
um, join the Bitcoin community. Uh, did you want to say some final thoughts and then we'll wrap up, Saifedean? For having me, yeah, and I think I'll just reiterate your call. Uh, let's put central banks out of business and we have the app for that. You'll contact your local Bitcoin dealer, stack as much Bitcoin as you can. Really, ultimately, the real battle is where are the world's cash balances stored? And the more the world's cash balances are stored in fiat institutions, the more that the fiat war machine can continue to rob us to finance itself. And the more of our money is stored in Bitcoin, in advanced civilized technology, the less they can steal from us. So st stack as much Bitcoin as you can. Awesome. We're going to end it there. That's um, all we've got time for. We went over because I just thought it was such an important topic. We covered a lot of ground. That's Bitcoin Hard Talk, episode 47. And uh, there's so much more. Uh, let us know in the comments section below. Um, and we'll try and get Saifedina back for another topic. Uh, because it's just such a, an important area for all of us. So thank you very much for all of your work, say for Dina Moose, quite frankly, your book and everything, the work that you're doing, it is a team effort, um, but you've had a big, big, big impact in the Bitcoin community. Um, and thank you for all the work that you have done. And I can't wait to see a free Palestine. This is not a left thing or a right thing. This is a free, this is a free market thing. This is property rights. Um, and this is just protection of humanity and the things that are most sacred to us. And that is our children, quite frankly. Thank you.